Sandrine, thank you. Pleasure. I really enjoyed reading the book. And to me, it was a really important moment to pause and reflect, actually. Mm -hmm. We need these moments to pull it all together and say, where is the big picture heading? And so you're, with your co-authors, really to be congratulated mm -hmm. on pulling that big picture together. You talk about major turnarounds and they clearly require the reshaping of whole markets and economics and long-term thinking. And in the book, you highlight that actually there's a major role for governments there together with citizens to, to drive that change and really put the emphasis there. But you have also quite experienced in mobilising private sector action and that's something we do here at CRSL as well. So my question was, where do you see the role in the private sector in driving that, that wider systemic change? So I, I see the role of the private sector in two ways. One is that they are already key actors in the chain. There's also huge lobbying and I've been on the front end of that for quite some time. If you, for example, look at the COP process, so that's the climate negotiations, we had the lobbying from the oil and gas sector, 650 lobbyists that were at COP27. But by the same token, we had the most unbelievably determined investment community and private sector community that was really trying to bring forward new solutions. And so we're a little bit at this private sector tipping point where they've realized that it embodies what they want to see change. And that is going to be the new business model. You can talk about an Emmanuel Faber, for example, or you can even talk about a Paul Pullman and many of them we've worked with here at CISL. You know, these are visionaries that are really trying to change the system. The problem is the system is broke. And you can see that in over-financialization. For me, that is what is creating the lack of deep systems change. Because we're so caught up in shareholder value, we're so caught up in short-term profit making, that it is impossible to break that cycle. I mean, Paul Pullman wanted to, with actually longer term reports, rather than just going into quarterly reports. Emmanuel Faber wanted to, and we know what happened with him. I mean, the shareholders came in and booted him out. So the fact of the matter is, when actually we've got incredible corporate leadership, we see that somehow they get squeezed in their decision making because our financial system is hotwired to do something totally different. And that is why this book is important. And that is why I've shifted a little bit in my perspective, coming from my 30 years of working with business, working with policymakers, I actually don't think that we're going to get out of this mess unless we put in place real government leadership that puts in place the necessary policy and regulation to really change things. And that we move away from a GDP model where we're only thinking about productivity as the only way in order to stimulate our economies. So the other thing about the book is it provides some really big ideas, actually, about how to intervene in the system and create these big, big turnarounds. And you talked about shareholder acceptability, actually, and around a corporate ambition. And the model has these kind of checks and balances where it tries to say, OK, on one hand, in the business as usual scenario, there's a lot of social instability. On the other hand, are these actions going to be socially acceptable? Mm. So there are these kind of boundaries you're trying to tread either way. And in, in particular, the ideas around income redistribution, universal basic dividend. dividend, these kinds of ideas traditionally associated with the left politically. And where, where you think that some of these really big ideas may hit some political buffers or cultural buffers and the, the social and political viability of, of the ideas? <laughs> So it's really interesting because as we started to explore the book, we realized that there are now enough examples to demonstrate that governments can do things differently. So the Norwegians have obviously been doing wealth distribution for quite some time, and they're, they're lucky. They've been held with some amazing natural resources, but the Alaskans are doing it too, and Alaska's definitely not to the left. And what you also see is then we've got these five well-being governments that have put in place, in particular pre-COVID, a government model and an economic model that puts equal footing between social, environmental, and economic indicators. So GDP is no longer the only stimulus. Who do you think did the best during COVID? 
Why? And it's the same with many ESG rated companies, by the way, because they stress tested their value chain, because they started to see where resilience was. We no longer can live in a world where we think that we are not going to be confronted with multiple crises. We will be. And if we don't have the foresight, we as leaders, all of us, whether we be policy leaders, citizen leaders, leaders in our community, whatever we are, if we don't start to have the foresight and intelligence to think through that the current models are totally broken, they do not respond to the crisis points that we are going to be hit with and that we've already been hit with. I mean, look at the value chain disruptions. We are totally dependent on about five economies. In terms of food, only four. And in terms of most of our minerals, but also in terms of our electronics, China. So the fact is, we have to understand that we have to wean ourselves off a model that does not work and no longer generates also income for the many. By the way, this is the first generation that will make less than its parents. It's the first generation that has the highest amount of suicide rate and also mental illness. And we see that time and time again. So my way of rationalizing this is we actually have no other choice. Otherwise, we're just basically committing Harry Carey. It's, it's collective suicide. And it's stupid because we should be smarter than that. Thanks, Andrew. So one, one last one for me before I turn it over to the audience. You were talking about political leadership from China and the US, and obviously we've had a change of administration. The US was in the Paris Agreement, then it was out of the Paris Agreement, yeah. and it's back in the Paris Agreement. A Biden with a big legislative agenda trying to bring together the left and the right. And obviously you've got the Green Deal in the EU, and we know that there are huge populations in India and China where living standards need to be raised and each taking slightly different pathways towards balancing, bringing people out of poverty, getting to net zero. And I just wondered what kind of political leadership would be needed to overcome that? Yeah, there's a big question right now as to whether we need an authoritarian state or a democracy to get us out of the mess. And I actually, believe it or not, won a New York Times debate on the fact that supposedly an authoritarian regime would win. And I was blown away that I actually won it. But my premise was the following, not that we need a dictatorship, that we need authority. And hence why we were able to transform through COVID. States became states, worried about people. Some of them made big mistakes because they caved into the needs of only a certain amount. But most, most countries were thinking about solidarity, trying to protect their citizens. When was the last time that we saw this? No, I'm serious. What type of leadership forgets that they're supposed to service their citizens? Most leadership. Because they've all been bought out, and we know that our democracies have been bought out by multinational interests. So I would even claim that we don't have real democracies these days, because we've forgotten what it means to lead for people. And I think that is incredibly important. Now, is it going to be tough to get back to what's most essential? Yeah, it was tough during COVID. But is it unrealistic? No, because we all realized during COVID that coming back to what was most essential, living, trying to thrive, not just survive, that our friends and family had access to medical services, that we had access to social services, that it didn't matter how great our wardrobe was because we didn't need our pants or our trousers most of the time because no one saw them anyway. We could be in shorts or, or something else. And, and that we didn't have to have a certain amount of cars because we couldn't go anywhere. The fact is it brought us back to reality of what is most important. Now the problem is, of course, why do we need a pandemic to teach us that? And I think that that's part of the learning. So when we're told by leaders transforming is too difficult, I call bullshit on that. Excuse my language. Brilliant, Sandrine. Thank you. I think we've opened up hopefully a few different lines of inquiry there, and I can see some tentative hands from the audience. Got um, got his hand Marcus up. has got at least five uh, questions from online, but I, I think I will just start in the room. If I could take the gentleman at the back, and then I'll come to you, Mona. Thank you so much for the talk. My name is Jonah Messinger. I'm a physics PhD student here. You know, I noticed how you laughed off some of the critiques that have been made of the Club of Rome. The Harvard anthropologist Susan Greenlaw wrote a book where she details the link between the Limits to Growth book 
and the Chinese one-child policy. Hmm. It's just sort of interesting because Jürgen Yanders was here last year. He gave a lecture. And in that lecture, he said something very similar to what you just said, actually, which is, is that basically democracies are ill-equipped to solve environmental challenges. And he proposed a system more akin to Chinese totalitarianism. How is it that we can rectify those goals of empowerment, alleviating poverty, enabling equality, and then at the same time, we see the results of the limits to growth from the one-child policy? Might it be worth reflecting and maybe even reevaluating some of these Malthusian predictions instead of being so confident? Interesting. Okay, do you want to take a few questions first, and then I'll come back to your, to your very controversial but very important question. Good evening. I'm Mona Zogby from CISL. Thank you, Sandrine, for a very interesting presentation. I have two interlinked questions. First, the statement that you made on poverty reaching zero by 2050. Apparently, this is something that we've been all catering for for, for years and even centuries, and we haven't reached, so based on what claims. Mm -hmm. And the second is, to what extent you took compounding factors in the scenario building? Mm -hmm. For example, global geopolitics. Mm -hmm. We look at Russia and Ukraine and how that influenced the global energy. I was reading an article recently about Bernard Luni, the CEO of BP, who announced that they will be ditching their green growth plans and sticking with fossil fuels yeah. given the profit. And although exactly one year ago, in February 2022, he was being interviewed by Bloomberg where he was saying particularly the opposite, that they need to go towards green growth and green energy and this is what society needs and this is what shareholders need. So how easily the narrative can change. And so based upon all that, and what are the odds to actually achieve this sustainability transformation vision that you present in yeah. your book? So, so on the first question, I, I'm not trying to laugh off the conspiracy theorist, but I would definitely question the fact that the limits to growth had the power to have direct links with the Chinese one-child policy. First of all, as many people say, the limits to growth were predominantly read in the West. It wasn't even read outside of the West in most cases. And Jürgen Randers came to his own opinion because of a lot of work that he did in China. And Jürgen Randers and I argue a lot about this, as he does with other members of the club. N most of us, and I even think Jürgen definitely would not say that a dictatorship is the right way to move forward and to get us out of the existing mess. But what he would say is we need to have a strong state in order to guide us through. The reason for that is that we have not seen with the neoliberal market structures that we have as much poverty alleviation as we would have hoped. In fact, we're seeing that as wealth increases, inequality does not decrease. Now, what's really interesting about your question, though, is how do we actually convince those that are very dubious of what we're trying to say and do that actually this was bringing scientists and economists and different multidisciplinary modelers together? This was not just a Jürgen Randers show, if some would think that this was just him going on his own crusade of convincing everyone that we need to reduce population growth. It is absolutely a composite. In fact, that's why we set up the stress testing exercise of bringing thought leaders from across the globe. Because the reminder to all of us, coming also out of the limits to growth, is this was predominantly northern driven. And we have to have a, a proper conversation with most of the world, today in particular, which means that we need to address those inequalities, and this comes a little bit, Mona, to some of, of your questioning, which is around how do we then truly enable economic development in the parts of the world where there hasn't been as much economic development, where we're seeing actually low-income countries that are not able to get out of trade deficits, that are not able to actually get out of their constant debt repayment programs, and yet ourselves, where we're over-consuming, and this is the key conversation that we try to bring out in the book, that we need to reduce our overconsumption because we've gone far beyond what's necessary, and think through what a new type of growth looks like, which is predominantly a well-being model, coming back to the transformation that we saw through COVID. And then how do you look at the compound effects of the poly crisis 
And this is where I would say almost the next phase of the book is going into, because we were writing the book as we were going through COVID. We finished the book before the Ukrainian crisis. Mm -hmm. And now we need to think very, very deeply in Brussels with the conversations that we're having with policymakers, because the BP decision is a perfect example. Short-term profits, windfall profits that all of the big oil majors are feeling. And so they've left from the kind of beyond petroleum idea back to petroleum, totally anchored so that they can reap the benefits in the short term on the back of energy poverty. So how do you work with governments to ensure that they don't have knee jerk reactions, which is what's happening right now at the European level, going out into Africa to reap the benefits of pushing the Africans to become our new suppliers, both in terms of minerals, gas and oil, which is completely hypocritical rather than looking at demand. And by the way, we put together those demand scenarios. You can wean yourselves off Russian gas by 2030 by just putting in place the right energy efficiency directives. So how do we convince them to make the right decisions? So this is called CRC Conversations, and afterwards we hope you will stay around to, to talk. And I'd love to know a bit more behind your question, actually, because yeah. I think the question could be taken two ways, but this is the right conversation to have. I just want to come to the people online. Marcus, are you going to read out a clutch together? So firstly, Sandrine, everyone online is saying big thank you. There's been a lot of praise for your work and the book. And we've got greetings from Germany, the US, Romania, Brazil, Ireland, Sweden, the UK, Spain, Austria, and Switzerland, and Mexico. So... A pretty diverse listenership, nice. and I think that is reflected in the questions that are coming through as well. So Jürgen and Kelly have both expressed interest in how do we achieve longer-term change. Mm -hmm. Jürgen notes that you mentioned COVID was a proof of concept of systemic change, but this was temporary. And he quotes Donella Meadows as saying, mindsets create the highest leverage point in a system. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? And if so, how do we actually co-create the needed mindset shifts. Part of that mindset is discussed again in the book, but the book is small. We tried to put as much material in an easy readable book in order to address a very different type of audience than probably most of the publications from the Club of Rome in the past. And that was done very, very much because we wanted to have a broader audience. So to come back to the mindset shift, Yes, I think that most of us would agree that we need to work on mindset shift, but by the same token, I would say that we need to put in place the short term, this comes back to Mona's very good point, the short term levers for long term systems change. Having worked for two and a half years, for example, on the new financial taxonomy of what is a green project versus a brown project and being so disappointed, this comes to your point around geopolitics, that the geopolitics of France and Germany came out pushing nuclear and gas in the taxonomy, even though all of us as experts, including the investment community, including the scientific experts, including the European Investment Bank, said don't put gas and nuclear as green, with very clear criteria following the European objectives. And so that was a huge disappointment, and we did not see it coming, this geopolitical push, because we'd been asked by the European institutions to do this work as experts and thought that by putting in place the right scientific criteria, we got this. It took us a long time. So mindset shift is part of how do we get to work with people so that they really embody this new well-being idea of what it actually looks like to live in a very different world. But we, by the same token, need to continuously interact with the existing system in order to make sure that more bad decisions don't get taken. And that's where it becomes tricky. Thanks, Sandrine. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but the point around mindsets, to me, there's been a long conversation about getting beyond GDP. And one of the things here that you're saying is, what is it that the economy is delivering for us? You know, yeah. And the framing around well-being economies that in itself is a kind of mindset shift for many, many leaders and us as communities. Can so I just add to that, if I may? If you look at the well-being economy, it's not, again, as I said, it's not pie in the sky. I mean, we do have the indicators for a well-being economy. It means you're starting to place a value on education. Hello, look at what we're seeing again here right now in terms of the social unrest. 
the inequalities that are happening right now in terms of the pay the teachers are getting because we do not respect their work and yet they're fundamental in the society. The same with the police force, the justice force. I mean, most of the fundamental foundational pieces of our society are undervalued. And yet we place the greatest value on shares. And I, I just want to reflect a little bit on that. That is all we're trying to say is, can we come back to what matters? That, that would always be a mic drop moment right there, wouldn't it, really? I, I'm also looking at Emma because I know we're quite tight for time. Oh, Marcus, how many, how many questions are you sitting on? Could you pick one question for that and I'm going to come to John in the room? Or and... Bring them together, Marcus. OK, I'm going to try and merge them. Make, be, become systemic. <laughs> Thanks, Sandrine. So several people have pointed out that the SDGs are the most widely accepted framework for delivering change within the planet's boundaries. However, they do try to facilitate ongoing economic growth. Some people are saying, how do we scale that circle? And is any of your work trying to strengthen the SDGs rather than move away from them? And someone else mentions IDGs, Inner Development Goals, yeah. as an interim step towards that. Other people have also said, do you think sustainable finance is the key to unlocking this change? And are we seeing world leaders treat the planetary crisis yet as a war, citing the introduction of GDP as a wartime tool? Okay, interesting. I'm going to try to bring that together and then we'll go over here. SDGs, IDG, love the IDGs. I think we need to have inner development goals. Absolutely. SDGs are in, integrated into the system dynamic modeling. However, all of us have agreed that have worked on this program of work and by the way, have just had a conversation with the UN. Even the UN admits that the SDGs are not getting implemented in the way that they should. So we need to think through what is most important in the SDGs. And how can we implement them in the 21st century context, looking at the complexity of this poly crisis? And it may be, and in fact, this is a conversation I just had last night, using the system dynamic modeling to say, OK, for each SDG, we need to focus on these two. And this is what's going to be necessary for this decade of action. And then, yes, we, and that's the short-term levers for long-term systems change. We continue to build that long-term systems change. That comes to sustainable finance. I've shifted from financing change to change finance. Yeah. We can continue to finance change until the cows come home, but until we change the financial system, we're screwed. I'm sorry, again, coming back to what is most essential. We don't place a value on human life. We don't place a value on externalities. We don't place a value on nature. Instead, we place a value on shares in a company that is more important than all the employees that have just been fired. There is a total disconnect from the reality of where we are today if we're going to build resilience within our economy. And that is what makes me really torn about sustainable finance, even though I do think it's a short-term lever, but not a long-term lever for change. Did I answer those questions? Was there one that I forgot? That was great. I think some of the comments have come back on the thread saying nature is the only asset that matters and sustainable finance is a trope as long as it requires monetized profit. So we need to find ways to tie profit to nature. And last point on that, I mean, we've had a big debate in particular with indigenous communities just recently in Costa Rica, where we hosted actually indigenous communities and also youth together for one of our big conferences. And they will fight against the fact that you can't place a value on nature. We are nature, nature is us, that's the Ubuntu philosophy. But at the end of the day, and I'm part of a task force on nature markets, if we don't put in place governance to deal with the way in which we already have monetized nature for the wrong reasons, then we aren't actually going to shift the system. I can feel that there's a, there's a whole thread there yeah. on the value of nature, which we may not have time for tonight. John, final Last question, question of the evening. John. Thank you for tonight. It's been wonderful. I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on trust in government in particular. Mm -hmm. So the current evidence suggests we're going the wrong way. Yeah. So we've got an increase in populism. In the UK, we've got political policy fighting unionisation rather than moving towards it and decreasing worker rights. So my question is, how do we get the right leaders in place at a national level when our political system would appear to be unfit for purpose? Can we do this without a revolution or a crisis? Or do you think that's a necessary event horizon? Unfortunately, I think we probably do need a revolution. And we've seen that we needed a crisis to also create solidarity. 
I agree that most of our governments or many of our government structures are broken also because of short-term cycles and because of leaders forgetting why they were elected in the first place and only thinking about their next election. What's been really fascinating and in particular being intimately involved in the climate negotiations is to see how local leadership and city leadership has completely taken over. In fact, the so-called non-state actors have become much more powerful than the state actors because the state actors continue to either react through knee-jerk reactions, not put in place real ambition, except for the high ambition coalition of countries, and there are some clearly who are moving in the right direction. Whereas local leadership, and we saw this during the Trump years, that it was the local leadership that really actually demonstrated through the states across the US that they were continuing to decarbonize and to put in place the right measures. So I do think that our whole framework of governance has shifted where the state actually, in many cases, no longer has the power even to make the right decisions or even over the citizen. And that citizens now are much more active at the local level and that local leadership is becoming much more powerful. And it's local leadership that often is creating a shift within the state. A final example, if you look at Poland, it was the cities in Poland that immediately stood by Ukrainians and opened up their doors, put in place the right governance structures to make sure that it wouldn't go completely belly up with all of these Ukrainians coming in. It wasn't the Polish national government that did it. It was the cities. Another kind of mic, mic drop moment. I'm, I'm not going to have any time for any more questions, I'm afraid. With apologies to people who haven't been able to ask questions, just to say you know, a huge thank you to Sandri. She brings a huge passion to this subject, which is you know, something we all, all need, that passion and, and energy. And I think the, the richness of the debate and the diversity of the questions highlights really you know, exactly why we need kind of big picture views of the systems challenge. And there will be disagreement on the routes to get there and healthy disagreement and, and debate and discussion. And I think that's something that you, Sandrine, have called for a number of times. You know, we need to talk about this. We need to discuss this. And, you know, from, from my own perspective, that is the thing that this book offers is a sense of perspective and reminding us that, you know, there is one big system that all these parts are a part of. And uh, it's within our own grasp to decide the pathways we take within it, even though it's messy and complicated and difficult. And you can look out for the next event in the CSO Conversation series and follow Sandrine on her tour as she is speaking on this topic and the book with her co-authors in, in other places. So. Thank you very much, Sandrine. Please stay on, everyone. Have a glass of wine and a conversation. And thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you.